when Justin set up the day, um, he mentioned that you know, when we talk about grand brand growth, there really are, aren't any absolutes. And I think that's certainly true. We've seen different perspectives here. We've certainly seen the classic Byron Sharp model of build widespread mental and physical availability to the widest possible growth of buyers, whoever they may be, challenged. And the digital world does challenge that. So the question that Ed and I need to untangle is, is how do we make practical sense of that on a day-to-day -day level? Uh, when, when, when working in marketing, and we're going to have a go. We're going to have a go at doing that for you today. I think the first thing to say is, even you know, when when um, when uh, Ehrenberg Bass and, and Byron Sharp uh, first developed their thinking, they referred to the principles as laws. And I think we're pretty clear that they probably aren't laws anymore. But I think there's still there still are some use, useful frameworks and frames um, through which we can interpret um, Byron Sharp's thinking for the digital age, which I think you know Catherine's already touched on. So you know, first of all, this idea of availability still really really matters. Um, it still really matters that as a company and service that you find a wide base of either buyers, users, gawkers, whatever it might be, even if you're monetizing super fans. But of course, there are very, very different ways in, uh, to build availability now. There, are, there, aren't, there aren't two ways to do it. Um, you know, you've seen, you see two very different examples, for instance, in, in a service like WhatsApp. But you know, it's built its availability purely on network effects, really. And yes, that's built into the, the service now. Uh, but, it, but, but, but it's purely based on network effects. Similarly, you'll see startups and, and apps you know, uh, build their buyer base in a very, very different way. You know, they'll launch a service and still have to find that they need to invest in, in marketing and media in some way to start to build a base of buyers, to bring them in, bring into a brand. So clearly there, there isn't one way, it's a, blend, it's a blend of techniques that we need to get right. Um, that's exa exactly the same case for, for how we think about valuable users. Clearly there isn't one kind of valuable user anymore, and you need to understand who your valuable users really are. Are they super fans or, or are they a wide base of buyers? But there, there are very different ways to build valuable users, even within the same sector. And you know, two stark examples here, um, Oculus Rift, which was launched in Kickstarter, is already becoming a household name, already has value, and isn't really selling yet. You know, it's not a product that's available to buy. Uh, on the other hand, you have a, um, a story like Samsung Galaxy, and, and in many ways, Samsung, Gal Samsung and the Galaxy brand have been built on the back of kind of old school marketing investment. Samsung have spent their way in many markets to success. Yes, they've had good products, but I think back to 2010 when they released the S2 and it was well re reviewed. They told everybody about that. They invested in marketing, and that was a path to growth to them. So there are there, there aren't no there aren't absolutes, but there are techniques in the toolkit that can be used. The way I'm starting to make sense of this is basically that the challenge within uh, modern marketing and media is how you blend these two toolkits together into a coherent system, basically. Um, and that doesn't mean that every technique or, or thing I've listed here um, uh, uh, is relevant for every band, but it's about finding that balance of techniques and principles and practices that work for you. And in many cases, it means pulling different levers at different times in, in a brand's journey to growth. And sometimes that can be the sort of pure tactics of digital startups, whether that be you know, uh, different pricing models, free growth hacking techniques in the way you develop your digital assets or, 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 um, or experiences, member get member, etc. Uh, but it could also be very important still to, in some categories, to, to think about effective share of voice, brand salience, um, upper funnel marketing, the role of direct response comms in, in driving acquisitions. Even the gaming industry relies heavily on, on direct response techniques to bring even free um, users uh, into their properties. So it's really about the system. And it's not, it's, uh, these aren't two different things. These are things that operate together in a coherent system. I think part of the challenge is, is getting that all working together. Just two examples to bring this to life. One is a, uh, a digital pure play, uh, not in the high street. Um, you know, they have a very good you know, novel uh, proposition when it comes in retail. Um, and, and what we see is that their path to growth has been fueled and accelerated in a pretty old school way, which is, although they started to build their business a few years ago, it's at the end of 2012 when they started investing in uh, above the line marketing to bring to, to build their buyer base, they've, de they've seen a step change. The spikes that you see there are their seasonal peaks around Christmas. And what they haven't done is they haven't done the old school sharp thing. Sh you know, the sort of traditional sharp way of thinking of, of advertising is recency. You know, an even way to f of advertising in every week of the year to hit every single buyer who's available at every moment at every point in time. Uh, what they've done is they've spiked the spikes. And every time they've spiked those spikes, they've brought new buyers in to their system. And in turn, those new buyers have created network effects and relationships that have helped to grow in the business over time. So it's a, uh, a new kind of business still using uh, old techniques um, to, to drive growth. Um, a second example, which is the sort of the, the inverse of this, which is um, a client of ours in the room, Domino's. Um, um, you know, in many ways, their business was built historically in the UK on developing a really strong brand, 
rental availability uh, alongside expanding their, their store network, their franchisee network, physical availability. But they realized pretty early on, in fact, ahead of their competition, that um, virtual availability was going to change the dynamics of the marketplace significantly through takeaway business. And the first to launch a, a delivery service within pizza, within pizzas in the UK, the first to launch uh, in apps. And in fact, they, you know, in, in sort of a, a relatively short period of time, five years, the, um, the way that marketing is then con is conducted across that sort of system um, looks very, very different to what it did five years ago. Uh, yeah, it involves blending uh, data between um, the growth from below bit and connecting it with, with, um, with the growth from above and above the line marketing. Uh, and so that system looks very, very, very different. So if there are no, if there is no one size fits all model and there are no absolutes, um, uh, how do we make sense of this? Well, I don't think there are any laws, but I do think there are useful frameworks um, through which we can look at marketing and find the right formula for success. Um, there's one that we've been, we've we wanted to talk about today, which we've been developing uh, across the, the Havas Media Group. You might, you, if you're a client, you'll probably hear us talk about it um, a little bit more over time. Um, we're, we're calling it organic marketing, uh, and it shouldn't. Nothing that we say here shouldn't make sense or be new. It's just a way for us to frame how we're starting to think uh, about how we'll talk to you and frame strategies with you, but also how we're frankly having to develop our own services and, and capabilities um, with, within the group too. And there's three underlying underlying bits um, uh, for, of, of our philosophy that sit behind organic marketing. One, which is very much what, um, uh, what, what Nicholas has spoken about, is uh, we live in a different, we live in an organic world now. It's possible to find new ways to build reach, to build availability, and to build, uh, to build new audiences. Um, obviously, the classic example um, is, is through social network, but there, there, many, there are many other ways um, to do this in, in the digital world. And I think uh, uh, when you get this right and you have a, a meaningful story to tell, um, uh, your audience can be become your media. It's possible. It's not always probable, but it, it, it can be possible. Um, and uh, meaning is a very important bit. So you, again, if you're a client, you would have heard, heard us talk to you at some point about uh, a meaningful brands. It's a study, but it also is a, a, a philosophy, a way of thinking about brand building. Uh, and and the, the guiding belief behind that is that brands that uh, build a sense of meaning or purpose into what they do uh, will outperform uh, the category in some way. And I think um, the example around, uh, around the flower brands <laughs> really building meaning through the territory that it sits in is a classic example uh, of that. They're not just selling flour, they're selling their experience of baking. And they've built a really uh, a interesting set of meanings into their product and, and user design. But we think there's, there are other dimensions. There are also dimensions around um, you know, meaning in terms of what the brand does for me. Does it save me time? Does it save me money? Does it help me connect with people? Does it make me look good? And finally, there, there are collective benefits. How does it improve the world in some way uh, or improve society around me? And I think through, through, through a blend of getting those things right, you have a better chance of, um, of making the system work and, and standing out. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, the third thing that sits behind our thinking around organic marketing is clearly that the, the, the boundaries in, in, in media and advertising are starting to blur. And I don't just mean content marketing, although content marketing is part of this. I think uh, uh, Lionel's point around um, how they think about how Eurostar I think about creative across the year now. It's very different to, to advertising as it used to be. One asset deployed everywhere. You know, you have to think a little bit like a content producer and a publisher, even in standard, uh, even in advertising creative, you know, in the way you, you deploy your creative across the year. Uh, it requires thinking and de designing advertising campaigns and experiences that feel more like we are content makers than we are our advertisers. And so the, the kind of vision that we've, that, we've, that we've set out and that the group will talk a lot about is uh, understanding your drivers to becoming a me meaningful brand will help you unlock growth um, uh, in the first instance. Um, but that there, is, uh, there are specific ways in media that we can start to do this. Data increasingly becoming an important way to do this. You know, if, if you're a business that's able to, to build, collect, and action a data set, it's going to be much more valuable um, for you um, to think like a content maker. And then to think about how the four basic constituent elements in media um, start to work together. And again, this is nothing that you would have not seen before, but I think um, what we're coming, what we're saying is a, as a media agency, and I think uh, hopefully this is slightly refreshing, is um, that um, in this sort of new system, you don't start with paid most of the time. Uh, you know, it varies in some categories, but in fact, uh, often it's the end point. Um, you know, what you start with is, is, is everything else. You, know, you start with how you build your product experience, 
your digital footprint, your user experience, whatever it might be, but that is ultimately, and, and the story and the, and, and the meaning that sits behind your brand, that has to be the start point. Uh, the second area, which isn't getting increasingly um, interesting and of value, we think, is, is, is the shared media space. Um, the idea that, that, that partnerships and, and friends can help you in your, in your path to growth along the way. And, and, and I, kinda, I don't mean partnerships in the way that sometimes we've been guilty in media about talking uh, about partnerships, which is, uh, frankly, big bespoke project with media owners. It's true value exchanges with either uh, a media owner or with a, with a friendly brand. Like to use a, a gaming example, um, uh, you know, no coincidence to see that once Angry Birds hit a, a popular critical mass, it started partnering with film companies um, for mutual benefit, both because um, film companies could ride the back off the back of their user growth, but equally because they could help them refresh the game and the content and make it more exciting for players. So there was a true value exchange there. Earns, clearly this is where um, your audience can become your media if you, if you build a story and an experience for them, that's right. And then, then finally, none of these uh, paid media doesn't necessarily guarantee you um, engagement. It doesn't give you, it doesn't buy you love or super fan necessarily. What it gives you is the means to go and tell people about the things that you've done in this space. And you do that in order to, if you need to, to bring uh, new buyers, uh, uh, or lighter buyers or uh, new prospects into your, into your brand and into your category to help fuel growth. And that we think is is kind of the modern media framework. And yes, it's it's flexible enough to work in different ways for different brands. But this is how we're starting to make sense of it.